uns sehr, Herr Donahue, dass Sie heute bei uns sind. Ich darf Sie kurz vorstellen. Sie arbeiten seit vielen Jahren als wissenschaftlicher Mitarbeiter im Sprachenzentrum an der Technischen Hochschule Wildau in Brandenburg. Und ähm, Sie sind dort zuständig für die Planung, Gestaltung, Durchführung und Prüfung der Lehrveranstaltung Wirtschaftsenglisch und die Vermittlung von Soft Skills. Ähm, Herr Donahue hat an dem Trinity College Dublin in Irland Anglistik studiert und an der Univers University of Birmingham in England einen Masterabschluss in Applied Linguistics erworben. Um, und seit einem Jahr, wenn ich richtig informiert bin, arbeiten Sie zusammen mit Ihrem Kollegen Simon Devos an einem um, Erasmus-Plus-Projekt Pro, äh, um, mit dem Titel CLIL for All, wenn ich es richtig ausspreche, diese Abkürzung. Mhm. Um, und ich glaube, das ist ein Projekt, in dem Sie auch mit um, verschiedenen Partneruniversitäten in Spanien, Frankreich, Niederlanden und Finnland zusammenarbeiten. Das heißt, es ist durchaus sehr international auch aufgestellt. Und ähm, Ziel dieses Projektes ist es ja unter anderem ähm, Forschungsergebnisse zu diesem ähm, Thema Content and Language Integrated Learning zusammenzutragen, ähm, aber auch Pilotprojekte in diesem Bereich mit ihren Partnern zu initiieren. Und Sie werden uns sicherlich gleich auch noch mehr über die Pro äh, Projektziele ähm, erläutern. Wenn ich es richtig weiß, ist auch unter anderem, glaube ich, ein Handbuch geplant, ähm, was auch noch mal praktische Hinweise ja geben soll. Also sehr umfassend, sehr relevant, sehr interessant. Und ähm, ich würde vorschlagen, ich stoppe jetzt hier einfach mal und übergebe an Sie, Herr O'Donoghue. Ähm, wenn ich es richtig weiß, Sie werden Ihren Vortrag auf Englisch halten. Ich habe aber eben schon ähm, merken dürfen, dass Sie exzellent Deutsch sprechen, weshalb ich auch meine Moderation ich auf Deutsch hart. gemacht habe. Genau. Und ähm, weshalb auch äh, Sie später ähm, als äh, interessierte Zuhörende, Teilnehmende an diesem Workshop eingeladen sind, Ihre Fragen, Ihre Beiträge auf Deutsch oder Englisch zu formulieren. Vielen Dank, Herr O'Donnell. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Ja, wenn es keine Einwände gibt, dann würde ich gern, um, um, würde gern den Vortrag in englischer Sprache halten. Um, okay, jetzt muss ich mein... Um, okay. Sie sehen jetzt... Ja, okay, danke. Okay, right. Um, good afternoon. Uh, yeah, my name is John O'Donoghue. As you can see and hear, I come from Ireland originally, but... Um, I've been living for a long time in Germany, teaching in uh, Wildau and Brandenburg. Um, right, and the topic is content and language integrated learning, um, opportunities and challenges. Um, now I'm looking for the, I'm trying to get to the net. Yeah, okay, great, okay, that, that worked. Okay, first of all, we should um, define what we mean by content and language and integrated learning, because there are many different terms used. Um, EMI is maybe one that you know, um, English as a medium of instruction, um, but CLIL is a little bit different. Um, and I've got this um, definition from Doe Foyle, um, who wrote the classic book with David Marsh and, and Hood on um, CLIL. Um, the key thing is it's dual focus. So it's not simply the content, which is more or less what EMI might mean, that with EMI, you're simply uh, doing what you do in your native language in a foreign language. And you're not really looking at language itself, but simply just moving from one language to another. Um, but CLIL is about an additional language is used for the learning and teaching of both content and language. Um, so in the teaching and learning process, there is a focus not only on content and not only on language. Um, so I think your these things are interwoven, as the definition here says. Um, I, I would say that CLIL is driven by content um, and that it's not a 50-50 relationship. Um, but of course, there are times when language issues come up. Um, when you've got to define certain things, and I'll talk about that later. Um, but I think 
what certainly as language teachers were looking for a sensitivity and awareness of language. Um, and I think a lot of people teaching the foreign language do have that awareness. So it's about looking at both of these things. Um, right, what I would like to do today is um, to take you through a framework um, that Emma Dufault and Ute Smith um, have developed. Um, that's in the references below. Um, and it's about what is the framework when you're implementing a CLIL program? And there are six elements. One is uh, the role of English, um, the status of English. And if we think about different countries, you know, Finland, Germany, Spain, um, the relationship that people have there to English is really quite different. Um, the other thing is academic disciplines, um, which I think is really interesting, which is about language in terms of if you're studying engineering, to give simple examples, if you're studying engineering or economics or law, that there are not only very different kind of vocabulary uh, levels um, or le lexical areas, to put it like that, uh, words simply. Um, it's not just about words and glossaries, um, but it's about a way of talking um, that if I mean, for instance, um, if we take modal verbs, I don't know if some of you are language teachers, but um, in the area of engineering, um, there's probably one modal verb, and that is can. The machine can do this. If we're talking about economics, then you have the whole range of modal verbs with would and could and should and may. You know, If this happened, then that might happen. Um, so you're dealing with ways of talking um, belonging to a particular discipline. Um, the other thing is management. Um, and in terms, for instance, of allowing people into a course, do you demand a certain proficiency, um, C1, C2, whatever. Um, the other thing is agents. Basically, this means people. And the background to feel is certainly in secondary education in the last 20, 30 years has been people are doing it, i.e. that you have a teacher in a school saying, why don't I do geography in English? Um, so very much a bottom-up approach. That's the, the history of CLIL. Um, and to a degree that that's true also at third level. Um, right, how, our, I think our basic premise is that something changes when you teach in a foreign language. That is debatable, maybe. You know, you could say, well, I just throw all my slides, my PowerPoint slides into deep L, and then I have it, and then I go and do it, and that's it. Um, you know, so what? Um, but we would maintain that there, something does happen in the foreign language. Um, it creates a different dynamic. Um, and what are the practices and processes involved in that? The other thing that that has changed, as I'm sure all of you also experience, you know, when I go into the Mensa, the cafeteria at the Teo Villo, I hear a whole range of languages. Um, that internationalization has, has come to a, a town in Brandenburg. Um, and I can hear, you know, French and um, Bangla, uh, students from Bangladesh and Hindi and Russian and Ukrainian and, you know, a whole load of languages, Spanish. Um, so really, you know, I think internationalization, um, when some of us maybe started uh, 20, 30 years ago, meant students going abroad, you know, you went to another country, and at the, you know, now it's, um, it, it's here, you know, um, it's everywhere. Okay, um, right. Um, one size never fits all, and I think that's really important um, in the area of CLIL that what we refer to as situatedness, which sounds a bit complicated, but it simply means that every university has got a different culture, um, a different narrative, uh, to use the, kind of, um, the fashionable German word, um, narrativa. Um, so for, and this is what, what makes our project interesting, I think, um, is that not only in different countries, but obviously all across Germany, um, every, University is different in terms of their experience of global um, influences. For instance, we have yeah we, we have a, many students now from Bangladesh. Um, 
And uh, of course, there are national influences, regional, uh, we're in Brandenburg, uh, the institution itself, and then the faculty. Um, we have two faculties, one of business, um, computer science and law, and the other faculty is engineering. Um, so I think maybe I should warn you that there's no you know, single fit, there's no one recipe um, for implementing CLIL, that it's got to do with a lot of different factors which are you know, special to any particular university. Okay, right. So I'm going to take, take you through these now. Um, so the roles of English, um, I think, you know, we, we tend to think of English as being inclusive, um, that everyone in the world can speak it and that you can leave your little village. And if you're from a small country, if you know English, then you're part of this global culture. But one thing is also to think about if it is actually exclusive, if people feel excluded um, from programs in English. And part of our project is trying to say, well, if you create the right conditions that really anyone can study in English or, you know, certainly it shouldn't be. The point I'm trying to make is that in the past, it has been seen as somewhat maybe middle class, exclusive, um, privileged groups. Um, I, somebody mentioned a few minutes ago, um, the sons of doctors and lawyers and professional people like that. Um, and that has been very much, I think, the um, the core group, the target group um, for bilingual education. And what we're thinking about in this project is, well, can you at least increase that circle? Right, um, English. Um, lecturers use English because they're involved in projects and research, because they go to conferences. Um, the motivation for students, um, you know, one clear thing is that if they're studying finance and English, that they want to work at, you know, PricewaterhouseCoopers or Ernst & Young, um, and they're using their bachelor program to learn the language of accountancy um, in order to become an, an auditor. And it's very much related um, to their career goals. Um, another thing would be international contacts, whether they would they want to go abroad. Um, yeah, what I think one point I do want to make about um, language as a native speaker is that um, in the situation of CLIL, that we need to get away from the focus on native speakers. Um, native speakers are not the gold standard. They are not the standard by which we measure um, successful communication or not, whether you approximate to a native speaker or not. Um, I think we have left that behind us, certainly in applied linguistics, um, because of course it raises the question about, well, what kind of English do you mean? Do you mean British English, American English, um, Australian English, South African English, Indian English? Um, and what we have to focus on with Clearland, I think, for both lecturers and students is successful users of English. Do they use the language successfully? Um, and I think the standard which we now need to have is, are people comprehensible? Can you understand what people are saying? And whether they make what, you know, you can call mistakes, deviations from standard English is irrelevant. The key thing is, do the students understand the teacher, the, the lecturer? Um, does the lecturer understand the students? And of course, in an international group, do the students understand each other? Um, that's important and that, that can be tricky. Um, yeah, um, I'd like to get rid of another red herring, um, certainly in this part of Germany, um, that teaching in English is somehow a threat to courses in German, um, this is a, a situation which may be true in um, the Nordic countries, Scandinavian countries, maybe in the Netherlands, um, but certainly from, from wh where I'm sitting, um, the vast majority of our courses here are in German, um, and we only have two or three courses, um, one bachelor program and a few master programs taught in English. Um, 
And I, I, I don't think there's any need for people to worry about the disappearance of the German language or German culture. Um, one thing also about English is, um, are we, that actually for a lot of our students, they are not learners of English, they are bilingual and they are users of English. And I think this is a key distinction to make, um, whether the students are still learning English, I, I don't know, B2, C1 level maybe, and to what degree they are users of English, i.e. they use English in their free time. Um, and therefore we're not treating them as, um, you know, people who are learning English, but rather people who, who maybe have gone to a bilingual school, they've been using English for a long time. Um, yeah, um, there's another issue which is about quality. Um, simply put, does teaching a degree course in a foreign language means that you teach less? And does it mean that the complexity of the program suffers? I, to use the phrase dumbed down, do you make things shorter and simpler? Um, either because the professor needs to do that or the students need to do that. Um, that is an issue. Um, um, I think in a lot of cases, it's not a real issue, but it is something that people talk about and we need to be aware of it. Okay, academic disciplines. Um, I think basically it's about if you're studying accountancy, do you not only learn the vocabulary of accounting, but you learn to think like an accountant? Um, the other thing obviously is whether students are in a position to write their master thesis, bachelor thesis in English. By going to lectures, by sitting exams, by writing papers maybe, are they really learning the academic language that they need for the university? Are they also learning the discipline language, um, whether that's in law or engineering or whatever it is? Um, yeah, um, and then this has got to, got to do with um, when the professor says, well, that's right and that's wrong. Um, in every course, there you're constructing, you're validating truth propositions, you know. Um, and that's an issue um, which students have, well, the degree to which professors are teaching that and the degree to which um, students are learning that. Um, and I think there's an argument for saying that we need, as language teachers, we need to focus on these discourse functions, um, arguing, uh, defending an argument, questioning, um, that that probably is an area where language uh, becomes very important. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, have they, you know, one question is at the end of a year or two years, have they actually improved their writing or speaking? Or do they understand more? And I think what, what, one issue with CLIL and EMI and this whole development is, um, is it the job of the lecturers to promote these academic skills, to teach academic skills, as opposed to just lecturing? Um, do the, the students just pick it up? I think most of us, when we were undergraduates, probably a long time ago, um, going to university, going to classes, going to lectures, we kind of, we picked up the academic discourse. Um, it was in the air or I don't know what. Um, and I think one problem about not being in an English speaking environment, just having um, classes in English is maybe students don't pick up certain skills that we assume they should have. And then the point is, um, is it the job of a language center, a language te teacher to teach these academic skills? Is it the job of the lecturer? That's an open question. Right, okay. Um, yeah, and then language management. Um, should teachers be going through some certification procedure? Uh, there are many courses, uh, certificates, or is you know C1, C2 enough? Um, I think one important element is obviously professors are, you know, writing in English, they're reading English in journals. Um, but one thing is oral communication, um, the role of language for learning, asking questions. And there was a, people have been mentioning um, intercultural communication this morning. Um, 
how to get students to talk, you know, posing the right questions, um, feedback, um, correcting students, you know. Um, there are many different ways to do that. And I think sometimes professors maybe need to develop a certain sensitivity um, in giving feedback to students, particularly international students. Um, you know, still, um, you know, giving them positive feedback even when they're correcting them. Uh, so these are issues about, you know, confidence um, and encouraging students to communicate um, in a foreign language. Um, yeah, the other thing, um, I, I know we're kind of, um, kind of um, the time is passing, but um, one big thing about language management is the incentives to teach. Um, that professors saying that actually it takes an awful lot more time to prepare material in English. Um, it's just, it's a heavy, well, cognitive load, if you want to use that word, um, just more stress, you know. Um, and does the institution recognize that um, in terms of, well, either money, um, the language we all understand, um, or reducing their teaching hours in the sense that if you're teaching a foreign language that, you know, two SVS is then two and a half or three. Um, so that's got to do with the institution recognizing um, what it means to teach in a foreign language and offering assistance in terms of, well, the language center or other people um, in developing, adapting materials in English. So what kind of support is there from the institution? If the institution thinks that it's important, well, what are they doing to um, demonstrate their appreciation of that? Um, then um, there are documents. We have a language policy uh, that's going through the Senate, I think, at the moment. Um, so is there a statement by the university talking about bilingualism, multilingualism, internationalization, and the role of English? Um, and how does that all fit together? What, what people are doing in class, What's happening at the university? What's happening at the regional level? Um, how do these things align or not align? That's an important issue. Um, okay. Um, yeah. To to what degree are these things decided ad hoc? Um, and to what degree is there an actual sort of policy and entry requirements? And and who is actually planning this? Is it the um, the degree course directors, is it the um, faculty, uh, the dean of the faculty, is it the vice president? Um, and, well, to repeat what I said, whether language policy aligns with language use or not. Um, and then to what degree actually foreign languages are also allowed in meetings and presenting research um, on the website? Um, so the basic question is actually whether foreign students can nav navigate the website of the university only in English, or you are reading some kind of announcement or the, the first part in, in English, and then you click, and when you click, you find all the material in German. Um, so what, I, I think that is actually an issue about whether foreign students should be learning German, um, whether they should be able to, you know, um, communicate with the administration in German, or whether, in fact, they should be able to do everything in English. And then that obviously creates demands, pressure on um, whether it's going into the cafeteria um, and asking about food, or about um, going to the examinations office in the administration and finding things out. Okay. Um, it's about people, really. And I think a lot of um, CLIL, EMI, um, has been about um, a small group of people saying, let's do this in English. Um, whether that's setting up a degree program or um, people just individually saying, um, you know, I've done this in German for a while um, and now I want to do this in, in English. Um, yeah, who who is driving um, these courses? Um, and then how coherent is it? Are people working together? Is there a, a kind of common idea about standards or is it everyone doing their, their own thing? Um, and here um, I've mentioned other elements of internationalization. To, so to what degree is getting international students part of a, a greater policy? 
think one thing that we all know is it's not only about foreign students, also but foreign lecturers um, getting lecturers to come and talk in English. We have a um, we have that in the International Week where we invite partner universities to come and lecturers come and, and um, teach in English for a week. Um, and that obviously is an important part of internationalization. And the, the administration, uh, as someone pointed out a few weeks ago in a talk, the first point of contact for many foreign students is the administration. It's not the teachers. It's not other students. It's um, the administration. They are, you know, applying for a position, a, a place, a degree course. Um, and therefore, the communication skills of the administration staff are very important um, in terms of creating the right impression. Um, and it's not just about language, but also about culture. Um, yeah, you know, being ready to answer questions and do it. I think what I say a lot is we need to explain the German system that um, if you just translate a German document to English word for word, um, what you're missing is explaining um, the German way of doing things, which of course for Germans, you don't have to do because they're German and they know the German system. Um, if I can just briefly, I know we're, we're short of time, but um, polizeiliche Anmeldung, the fact that you have to register with the police in Germany, I found a frightening idea when I was uh, when I first came to Germany. I thought, why do I have to talk to the police? Um, and then people then reassured me, no, 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 you, you're not talking to the police. You're just going and registering where you live. Uh, that is a common thing in Europe. Um, in Ireland and the UK, it doesn't exist. Um, so I think you need to explain processes um, to people um, when they come from a different background. Um, yeah, I think... One thing, if we are teaching in English, are we teaching in an American, British way? Um, what are the academic norms and pedagogy is the way of teaching? Um, and to, to what degree, if you know, a lot of people then are using American uh, textbooks, um, which have a, you know, they're, they're shaped by American culture, certain values about communication and confidence. Um, so I think one, one question which is interesting is to what degree does the language shape uh, not only the content, but the form of teaching? Um, it doesn't have to be like that. I, I think there are some teachers who um, they teach in English in a very German way, um, but others, I think the material um, in a way changes their type of teaching. Um, a big thing now is that we should be using all the languages in the room. Um, we shouldn't just be saying, look, let's pretend we're in England or America, um, that if, you know, you have situations where the majority of people in the room, um, in the lecture are, are German, and therefore it seems perfectly natural to translate into German, or one common thing that professors here do is you check the comprehension. So you're saying, okay, we've been talking about liabilities, give me the German word for liabilities. If they say Verbindlichkeiten, then you know, okay, they understand what liabilities are. Yeah. Um, it could also be for giving instructions. Um, so I, I think um, that we, we should get away from this rule of it's only English, and that if people use other languages, then that's frowned upon. Um, we should be looking at um, not only the native language of most of the students, but other languages. and. Opening, opening the whole thing up. Um, yeah, and of course, what I mentioned earlier has, does teaching English change the way you teach? That's kind of the core question in this whole project, in this whole development. Um, and there are different answers to, to this. And, and, you know, one is no, which makes life easy. And then we can all go home. Um, but I, I think in the majority of cases it, it does change it. And in what and and does it change it in a positive way or a negative way? I mean, are teachers then more nervous? Is their vocabulary more limited? Can they not explain things as well in a foreign language? Um, or the opposite, you know, maybe, maybe they 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 feel more free um, in a foreign language, communicate better. Um, you know, these are open questions. Um, 
Sorry, John, well, for interrupting you, but yeah. uh, we're uh, like kind of running out of time. So I would it like is. to invite you to uh, welcome within a few minutes to an end. Thank right. you. Okay. Sorry um, for that. That's fine. Don't worry. Um, I, I knew it would be too long. Um, okay. We have the idea of uh, multicultural teams and how they work. Um, yeah, and gig giving support to students, you know, in an academic. I mean, what I notice is that, like, if you look at American universities, they've got many, many writing courses. Students have to attend not only one writing course, but 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 many. And at German universities, you don't really have that. Um, and maybe we should be focusing also on, you know, academic literary systems. Um, yeah. It, uh, do we all agree why we're doing English? You know, um, it normally it doesn't have to be English. It can be French and German, but normally internationalization is English. Um, is it integrated into the culture? Um, yeah. Or do some people resent the introduction of English or, or do some people feel threatened by English? You know, these, these are real questions. Um, okay. What I want to, um, yeah, I, I just have to do a bit of, um, kind of eigenwerbung, um, kill for all, um, you can visit our website and you know um, uh, send us an email. Something I would like to um, just point out: maybe people are, maybe there are people from language centers here or, or um, content lecturers teaching in English. Um, there is um, this is integrating content and language in higher education. Um, and a few months ago, they set up this Dach group, which, as you know, means in Germany, Austria, and uh, Switzerland. And it's about 20 or 30 um, people from language centers and teaching English who then, um, you know, want, want to talk about things at their university and, you know, best practice and um, getting ideas from other groups. Okay, I now will thank you very much for your attention and I'm glad to answer any questions, whether you put them in English or in German.